Hello and welcome to EE233. I'm your instructor, Gregory Myers. In this video, we're going to take a look at our sort version one, which allows for us to take a file that has integers in it and arrange them either in ascending or descending order, and then write the output to another file. So what we want to do in this video is we want to take a look at one of several sorting algorithms. This video is part of a larger series focusing on our sort demo and sorting in general. Um, in this particular video or in this particular algorithm, what we're going to do is we're going to utilize two different arrays. Now we're going to make some assumptions in this video. First is going to be that we have a sample underscore 01 dot txt that contains integers from 60 to 99, and also that we are only going to accept 100 integers. This is rather arbitrary, but the purpose for this will be seen in a later video when we compare our sorting algorithms. So once again, to begin with, you want to make sure that you have a file sample01.txt with some random integers in it. The first thing that we want to do is we want to take a look at our list of temporary variables or a list of variables that we're going to use in the function. In case you happen to be using an older version of this file, you'll notice that I may have changed some of the data types. And so particularly, you want to make sure that your data type for your array matches the input data type, meaning the type from your file. So in this particular case, your chunk or your data out of your file is expected to be an integer. Therefore, the unsorted and the sorted chunks array are expected to be integers. In addition, we have several temporary variables or index variables, as well as flags that we're going to be using. Um, you're going to find that we will not necessarily need all of these. Uh, and later on, when you optimize this function, you may choose to reuse some of your variables. For right now, let's not focus on that. Instead, what we want to do is we want to look at some of the code that I've provided for you, particularly in this particular uh, while loop here, we are taking the contents from the file. Uh, we have opened a file that is specified by the input argument input file name. We've opened it for reading. Um, please note that we are not doing any error checking to see whether the file pointer exists. Um, once again, that's something that you would want to do, but I'm trying to make sure that we focus solely on the algorithm in this particular video. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the file exists and we're going to assume that we're able to read out of the file integer data um, until we either reach end of file or we have reached 100 pieces of data. Either way, we jump out of our while loop, we close our file, and then you'll see that I have some placeholders here, particularly for the code that we're going to write, but then some additional code then that will allow for us to open another file for writing. Once again, the file name is specified by our arguments, in this case, output underscore file name. And you're simply going to write the results of the sorted array or the sorted chunks to the file and close the file. Also notice that we have a printf here at the bottom that simply prints out the variable loop counter. We are not going to cover that in this video. We're going to cover it in an additional video where we compare sort of in a layman's way or a, a crude way the efficiency of our three sorting algorithms. So without further ado, let's take a quick look at our variables. Once again, we have an unsorted chunks array that we're going to use to just hold the values from the file that are read in from the file. And then we have a sorted chunks array. In your mind, what I want you to envision is two sheets of paper. The unsorted chunks represents literally writing down the data in the order that it comes out of the file. The sorted chunks will then slowly become the sorted data 
as we go through the iterations of our loops. So to begin with, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to scan the unsorted chunks looking for the lowest value. We are then going to take that lowest value. We're going to copy it into the zeroth location or the index equals to zero location in our sorted chunks array. Then all of the data from our unsorted chunks array, starting with the index equals to zero, gets moved to the sorted chunks array. Specifically, all of the data before the location of the lowest value will be copied over to the sorted chunks array, but the location will be shifted forward one. And you'll see that in just a few minutes. Everything after the found data or the lowest integer found, all of the data after that will be copied over with no change in the index. Hopefully at this point, you'll start to see why I have specified a few different temporary variable names. In other words, these index variables as opposed to just simply reusing one over and over again. So without further ado, let's get started. So what we wanna do now is we want to start off by looping through all of the values in our array, starting with the zeroth location. And what we wanna do is we wanna compare those values to the remaining values in the array. So essentially what we're going to do is we're gonna take the value at the zeroth location, we're going to assume that it is in fact the lowest value in the array. And we're gonna compare the value at index equals to one. And if that value is lower than the value at index equal to zero, we found a new lowest value. If not, we go to index equals to two, compare that back to the lowest value and so on until we find a new lowest value. Now, the first thing that we need to do is we need to address what order we wish to organize our data. And so that leads us then to our third input argument or the order enum order. And if you take a look at the order enum by right clicking, navigating and going to the declaration, you'll see that our possibilities are ascending and descending. So essentially, we would like to sort our data either from lowest to highest or highest to lowest. So to begin with, let's focus on that. And we do that by writing an if statement that allows for us to compare the value in the order input argument to either ascending or under our else if branch, order equal to descending. Now, we currently only have two enum values. And in this particular case, it would be logical that we there wouldn't really be a logical third. However, it is good habit then to explicitly state whatever operation you're wanting to do for each one of your enums. And then if somehow a value was passed to your code or somehow there was a value changed in your code that added another enum or potentially passed a uh, an inaccurate value, we would simply want to handle that then under the else. And so in this particular case, what we want to do is else print F error unhandled enum. Now, um, we would also want to modify our code a little bit to handle this scenario. In other words, we probably would not want to print out an output file uh, if there was an unhandled enum passed. Currently, the way this is set up, uh, it just blindly then copies the data from the input file to the output file. So there's really no harm. It's just this is probably not the behavior that we would ultimately want. But once again, we're trying to focus on our sorting algorithm and we'll come back in a later video and we'll do a little bit of cleanup in our logic. Now, 
focusing on the ascending, the order e equal to ascending. The first thing that we want to do is we want to decide, do we want to do this with a for loop or a while loop? And, and it really doesn't matter other than we have to decide how we wish to initialize our index variables. And so for this particular example, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with a for loop because that allows for us to do it all in one line. And so what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the value found at the starting index is in fact the lowest index. So what we do, or the lowest value rather. And so what we do is we build a for loop that starts off using our low index variable at index equal to zero or at the beginning of the array. And we continue with that low index up to our count and our count will either be the total number of rows in the file or a hundred. It, it could potentially be less, but it cannot be more than a hundred. And then also we simply want to say then low index plus plus. Now inside of this outer for loop, we want to make the assumption that we have not found a lower value. So the first thing we want to do is we want to initialize and reinitialize on every iteration of this loop that found is equal to a false. So remember, if you would, that zero is going to be mapped to false with one mapped to true. So in this case, what we're doing is we are simply assuming then that we have not yet found a new lower value. So in addition, we also want to say that the lowest value utilizing our found index is actually equal to the location. The found index is equal to whatever the low index is. In other words, we are simply assuming that the lowest value is the first value. And remember that as we increment our low index, what is viewed as the first value will change. The next thing we want to do, and this is much more of a convenience variable is we want to set the found value. We want to pull out the value of our unsorted chunks variable, particularly we want to pull out the value at the found index. Now, as you, as you get better at writing these sorting algorithms, you're gonna realize that this uh, variable right here is, is technically not needed. And I'll try to point that out as we go along. Now, what we wanna do is we want to then compare the value at the low index with essentially every value that comes after it. And so to do that, we are going to write a second for loop, an inner for loop that utilizes our search index variable. And our search index variable is going to start off at our low index variable and essentially one past it. So in other words, what we're going to do is we're gonna compare the neighbor of the lowest value to the lowest value. And then likewise, we simply say search index or we stop our search index when we get to the count or to the maximum value in our array. And then we increment the search index by one. Now, at this point, you probably should have noticed a cause for concern. If you look at our low index variable, we start off at zero and we continue up to count. In other words, if we have a hundred elements in our array, we would start at zero and we would exit out of the for loop after the 99th index. But the question is, 
what would we compare the 99th value to? Well, the 99th value needs, and when I say 99th value, I'm referring to the index equal to 99, which is actually the hundredth value in the array because we're starting with zero based indexing. It means that we're going to falsely attempt to compare it to a hundred and first value. Now, fortunately, the way our for loop is written, it won't allow us to do that. But essentially what is happening here is you are running your outer for loop one more time than is necessary. And so what you want to do is you want to stop your low index at count minus one. And so essentially what this will do is it will allow for you then to run up to and including index equal to 98 and the inner for loop will simply compare the value at index equal to 98 to the value at index equal to 99. Now, how do we go about actually comparing these values? Well, this one's pretty straightforward. We simply say, if our value at our unsorted chunks square brackets search index is in fact less than or equal to our found value, then what this means is we have found a new low value. Now, the question that we want to ask is, do we want to include the equal sign here? Well, if we have a equivalent value, it wouldn't really make sense to necessarily identify it as a new low value. In other words, it currently does not need to get moved. It may get moved later, but we are only actually interested in truly lower values. So in this case, what you can do is you can drop the equal sign and instead then our else is going to mean that the value is greater than or equal. In other words, do nothing. All right, so what does it mean when we have found a new low value? Well, the first thing we wanna do is we simply wanna say found is equal to true. From there, we simply want to catalog or identify or store where we found it. So we say our found X index is simply equal to whatever the index is that we just searched or a search index. And then once again, we're going to use our convenience variable, and that is our found underscore value, which is going to be equal to the value in the unsorted chunks, square brackets, found index. Now, hopefully at this point, you can see that our found value is nothing more than a convenience variable, meaning that what we could have done is we could have simply compared the value at the unsorted chunks square bracket search index to the unsorted chunks found index because essentially that is all that is being stored in the found value. Once again, I'm gonna keep it in here because we wanna focus on the algorithm. And if it means that we are using one or two additional extra variables for clarity, that's perfectly okay. Because if anything, we can clean that up later. Now, Assuming that you have now went through all of the iterations of the inner for loop, we need to then ask ourselves if we found a new low value. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to check if our found is equal to one or to true. Else, well, there's nothing really to do. Well, what do we actually do if we found something? Well, this is where that second array comes into play. And particularly, this is where you want to think of the two sheets of paper analogy. 
So on the first sheet of paper is the original array, or if you want to think of it in terms of the file, the original contents of the file in its original order. And what you have done by identifying a new low value is simply put a check mark by the location in the original array or in the original file that indicates the lowest value. Now, what we want to do is we want to copy that low value over to the new piece of paper at the top location. And so from there, then what we want to do is we want to move all of the values that came below that found value over to the new piece of paper. But if you notice, we have to essentially write it below. And then we take all of the values that came after the found value and we simply copy those over, but their positions don't change. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to use the sorted chunks array. And our first step is going to be to copy the new low value to it. Then what we want to do is we want to copy all of the values that came before the new low value. And then we copy all of the values that came after the new low value. And the difference between the two is that for the values that came below, we shift the index. And for the values that came after, there is no shift. And then the last step, which is going to seem a little bit counterintuitive, is that we simply copy the sorted chunks back to the unsorted chunks. Remember that we are not going to accomplish the entire sort in one pass, except under very, very rare circumstances. In other words, essentially where there is only one piece of data out of place. So what we want to do is we want to repeat the process for all of the data in our array. And in other words, this for loop is going to be guaranteed to run a certain number of times. And we'll come back to that in just a second. So for this particular algorithm, whether there is one piece of data out of place or no pieces of data out of place, the algorithm is still going to run. So let's go ahead and fill in some code here. How do we copy the new low value to the sorted chunks? Well, we just simply say sorted chunks, square brackets, low index is going to be equal to whatever the value is of the found value. So we have two options. We can either say found value, or as I mentioned earlier, found value is really just simply a convenience variable. So instead what we can do is we can specify the unsorted chunks square brackets found index. And once again, I don't really mind which one of the two you use. Either is perfectly fine, but just recognize that found value is simply there to help us. Now, how do we copy all the values that came before the new low value and shift the index? Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to create a for loop. And so our for loop is going to essentially copy all of our values. And in this case, we're going to go ahead and use another temporary variable. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use our move index. And so our move index is going to be equal to our low index. And our move index is going to continue up to, but not including our 
found index. So in other words, that's going to move all the values before the found index. And then once again, we simply increment our move index. And from there then, we simply say sorted chunks, square brackets, move index, and we increment that by one to indicate that shift we were talking about is going to be equal to the unsorted chunks, square brackets, move index. And so hopefully you can see that essentially what we're doing is we're moving all of the data forward lo one location when we copy it over. Now, for the values that came after the new low value, we simply say for move index is equal to our found index plus one. Essentially, that allows for us to jump over the found index. Once again, we continue until the end of the array. In this case, we're going to leverage our count variable and we increment our move index. From there, we simply copy to the sorted chunks array utilizing our move index the values from our unsorted chunks, square brackets, move index. In other words, if you see here, there is no shift in our indexing. And then the last step, which once again seems a little counterintuitive, is we simply move all of the data from the unsorted chunks back to the sorted chunks. And so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to have a fairly straightforward for loop starting with our move index equal to, since we're going to copy the entire array this time, it starts at zero. It continues until we hit the count and we increment our move index and no shifting is going to take place. We're just simply going to say unsorted chunks, square brackets, move index is going to be equal to sorted chunks, square brackets, move index. Now, before we leave the ascending branch of our function, in other words, where we have our order equal to ascending, we want to think about an edge case. In other words, a scenario that we really don't have in this particular sample file. And that is, we'll focus just on a single example here. And that is, what happens if the lowest value occurs in the first line of the file or in the zero index of the array? And as an extension of that, what if the beginning of the file is essentially already sorted, but the latter values in the file aren't. Well, for this particular algorithm, if you take a look the way that we've written it, we only ever copy from our unsorted chunks to our sorted chunks if we have found a new low value. So particularly what I'm doing is I'm referring to this right here. Now, under the scenario in which let's say 60 was our first value. In other words, it's the lowest value in the file. Essentially what would happen is we would bypass to our else and we would increment our low index. This means that essentially the array sorted chunks would never store the lowest value, in other words, 60, in the index equal to zero. And then upon the next iteration, assuming that the second value or the index equals to one is not in its correct location, we would copy over the second lowest value 
into sorted chunks, square brackets, one, and then move everything before the found index, starting at the low index, we would move it to the sorted chunks. But remember that the move index would be one. Essentially, there would be nothing to move before the low index. And the tail then, or the remaining part, would be moved with no shift. Now, we could change this in a couple of ways. So first, we could actually change this line right here, where our move index would then start at zero. We would move everything that came before the found value. If we change the move index equal to zero, in other words, we started moving from the zeroth location, we would end up unnecessarily or actually incorrectly moving values that were already in their correct location from the unsorted chunks where they were already in their correct location, we would move them forward by one. So we don't necessarily want to change this. However, we do need to find a way to be able to capture the original values or the values that were in their correct location to begin with. And so essentially what we will do under the else in the scenario where found is equal to, to false is essentially what we'll do is we'll make a partial copy. In other words, we're only going to focus on one particular value, and that is going to be our unsorted chunks, square brackets. And then whatever that uh, particular low index is, so our low index. And what we want to do is we want to assign now that value to our sorted chunks, square brackets, low index. And essentially what this does is this is one way of handling the scenario in which our low value actually occurs at the beginning of the file or the beginning of the array, or perhaps a sequence of correctly sorted values occur at the beginning of the array. Essentially, what will happen is that just those values will be copied over. Now, you could go ahead and copy the entire array over from our unsorted chunks to our sorted chunks, although that would be unnecessarily inefficient. We are not worried too much about optimizing in this particular example. As a matter of fact, as you dig into this, you'll see that there are a couple of other places that we can optimize this algorithm. But more importantly, what we want to do is make sure that no data is being lost. And this just assures then that if 60 resides at the beginning of the file or the beginning of the array, that we simply go ahead and copy it over to our sorted chunks. Now, just to prove this to yourself, I would encourage you to, to use another sample file with a lower value at the beginning and comment out this portion. Um, and you'll note then, for instance, when you increment the low index, essentially skipping over the first value in the file, that you will effectively end up not copying it back to the unsorted chunks because it will have never existed in your sorted chunks array. Instead, with this line in here, it will simply copy over one piece of data or correctly located data to the sorted chunks array. And then from there, when you find a piece of data that is in its incorrect location, it will have already been written in the correct location of your excuse me, all of the previous data will have already been written to the correct location in your sorted chunks array. All right, so let's go ahead and
take a second to compile this one. Let's make sure that we haven't got any catastrophic errors in our code. That doesn't mean that we don't have any logic errors. Um, what we can do is clean up some of this. We'll tighten up some of our code here. And then at this point, what we want to do is we want to see how it would change for our descending. And so in this case, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and copy all of my code over in my ascending branch. And I want to paste it into my descending branch. And this is now where you want to take a second to think about what fundamentally changes. Well, the answer is not a whole lot. Instead of our less than, we simply want to change our less than to a greater than. And now we, what we have done is we have found a new high value. And under the else branch, that simply means that the value is less than or equal. In other words, do nothing. So let's go ahead and build this one more time. And then let's go up to our main and discuss how we're actually going to run our sort version one. Now, if you've watched along with some of the earlier videos, you know that we would like to be able to test this uh, from the command line. Uh, we are going to go ahead and use a file for this particular example, but we would want to specify the input file that we would want to use through a command line argument, as well as the output file. And it would also be nice to be able to specify the order. And so what I want to do now is I want to be able to pass an appropriate number of command line arguments using our argv and then also utilizing our argc variable. So let's think about this for a second. The executable is the zero argument. The slash or the switch rather that indicates what function we want to run would be index one. In this case, it would be sort underscore version one. The name of the input file would be index equal to two. The name of the output file would be index equal to three. And then the string that corresponds to the order would be index equal to four for a total of five arguments. And so what we want to do is then we want to check to see if our argument count is equal to five. And more importantly, what is the argument that resides in argv square brackets one. And so to see that we use our string compare i and we compare argv square brackets one to our switch. In this case, we're gonna keep the function name as the switch name. So we're gonna to check to see that it matches the sort slash v1. And if that is going to be equal to zero, in other words, that that matches, we're going to assume then that argv2, argv3, and argv4 are correct. Now, I'm going to go ahead and use a couple of temporary variables here to store those arguments so we have explicit names to use here. So we're going to set up a character vector. Um, we're going to call the first one input underscore file name. And we're going to make it 30 characters long to give us plenty of room. We're also going to have a output file name, likewise 30 characters long. And then we want to also have a string to be able to store the order or argv square brackets for. And that can be a little shorter because it only needs to store ascending or descending. And then the last variable that we need is just going to be our results variable. And it's an integer and it just simply captures the exit success or exit failure from our sort function. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to use our string copy function to copy to the input file name the contents of argv square brackets two. Likewise, we want to use our string copy function to copy to the output file name the contents of argv square brackets three. And then lastly, we want to use our string copy function to copy to the order string, the contents of argv square brackets four. Now, the reality of it is, is these once again are simply convenience variables, but hopefully they help in clarifying 
how we're doing this. Now, we want to be able to convert the string or the arg v4 of order into the appropriate enum. And we can't just pass a string to our sort v1 for that third argument. Instead, what we want to do is yet again use our string compare i function. And our string compare i function will allow for us to compare the order with the word ascending. And if that matches, in other words, if that's equal to zero, then we would call our sort function using the ascending enum. Well, we continue with this and we do an else if to check to see that our string compare i, we match the order for the descending. And if that is equal to zero, then we simply call our sort function using the descending enum. And then of course, under the else, we simply want to print f error unhandled enum. Or what we can do is we can make a call to our help function. Now, I've went ahead and set up our help function like in some of our earlier demos. And I have pre-populated it with some examples for utilizing our help or utilizing our executable. In this particular case, I went ahead and started with our sort v2 but essentially the switches are going to be the exact same. And so what we wanna do now is in our help, we wanna provide some instructions to the user on how to use our executable, particularly when we wanna give them a demonstration using our sort v1. We wanna to provide to them a text file input, as well as the name of the output file that we wish to specify and the string that corresponds to one of our enumerators for our order. Hopefully you see that it is very similar for the descending. And please note that there is no reason that the file name, the output file name needs to match the enum. That is just simply for clarity. In other words, this descending.txt does not have to match the descending for the enum for the string for the enum. Okay, so let's come up here now. And let's see if we've got everything handled the way that we would like to. In other words, what we wanna do now is we want to make a call to our sort v1, and we wanna pass the return value then to the results variable. For the first argument, we simply want to use our input file name. For the second argument, we wanna specify the output file name. And then what we wanna do is rather than use that order string as the third argument, we simply specify ascending. Notice that there is no quotes around ascending, but rather that it is the value associated with that enum. Likewise, under the else if branch, we simply say sort version one, and we specify the input file name as the first argument, the output file name as the second argument, and then descending, once again, without quotes for the third argument. Now, a couple of things to note here is we technically did not need the arg uh, our input file name, we could have simply used argv2 directly. We could have also used argv3 directly for the output file name. And also note how we are essentially converting the string that is provided by argv4 into the corresponding enum by simply using a little bit of logic. So 
Let's go ahead and build it. Let's come over to our command line and let's go ahead and run our application. So the first thing we wanna do is type in DIR and we wanna make sure that our sample underscore 01.txt is in the same folder as our sort demo. Looks good so far. So let's go ahead and run our sort underscore demo using our sort underscore version one as the switch. We wanna specify the input file, which was sample underscore 01.txt. And we also wanna specify the output file. Now I'm gonna deviate a little bit from the help to emphasize that the file name does not necessarily have to match the last argument. And so in this case, what I wanna have is sample underscore 01 underscore ascending to indicate, once again, just to be helpful to us what the contents of the file should be and the file extension txt, as well as the last argument, which is simply the string equivalent of our enum. And if we hit enter, in this particular case, we appear to have a delay, so we may have some problems in our code. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit control C real quick, see if I can stop our executable. Based on the ridiculous delay in processing a file with only 100 items in it, the first thing that should come to mind is that you probably have a rogue loop. Now, in this case, it's going to be a little unusual because we used for loops instead of file loops, but essentially the flag here should be that with this long of a delay, that you probably have some sort of infinite loop. So before we uh, dig too deep into it, let's just simply uh, browse our code. In other words, bench test our code and looking for an issue with the construction of one of our loops. So you'll see here that the first outer for loop seems to be in order uh, because it not only starts at an initial value, it has a viable condition as well as incrementing our low index. Likewise, the second for loop or the nested for loop also increments our search index. And we continue down under the branch where found equal to one or found equal to true. And you'll notice that we have accidentally, and by we, I mean me, has accidentally forgotten my increment. So I specified my move index, but I forgot to do move index plus plus. And for those of you that were following along, you may have actually picked up on that error when I first made it. But let's go ahead and build it. Notice that this is an example of a, not necessarily a syntax error that would cause a compile error, but definitely a, a logic error because it did not intend to, uh, I definitely intended to increment the index. All right, so let's see here. Hopefully that's our only mistake. If so, that wouldn't be too bad. Um, and so we go ahead and rerun it. Notice how it was much snappier, much quicker, but more importantly, if I type in DIR, I have my sample underscore 01 underscore sending dot TXT. Now we can access this uh, text file a couple of different ways. We can say uh, notepad and notepad should be on your system. Um, if it's not, you can add it to your path, but notepad.exe, and we can specify the sample underscore 01 underscore ascending.txt and hit enter, and up should pop the notepad with the file. And notice that our values are sorted from the lowest to the highest. You can also at this point type in explore.exe and simply hit period, which will then open Explorer in the current folder. And in this case, I'm going to drag it over from my other screen and you'll see there are my files. And particularly, we want to take a look at our sample underscore 01 underscore ascending, which you can then drag and drop into NetBeans. And sure enough, there you go. You see that we have our file in ascending order. Now, Let's see if our descending works. And so I'm gonna hit the up arrow twice. I'm actually a 
several times here. I'm going to change the file name to descending, as well as the enum or the string that should match the enum. And you'll once again see that delay. So that means that tells us that whatever mistake we made in the true branch of the if statement, we probably also made in the else if. And this is a great example of the downside of duplicate code. In this case, we're not going to focus too much on that. We'll handle that in another video, but you do need to go ahead and change or add the plus plus if you did not already do it to the descending branch of your if else if. Now, we're going to compile it one more time and we're going to rerun it by just simply hitting the up arrow, hit enter, much, much faster. And more importantly, now we have a fourth file in our folder, which we can drag and drop into NetBeans. And sure enough, we start at 99 and we go down to 60. So hopefully you found this video useful. Uh, once again, I encourage you to look at the other two videos in this sort series of these elementary sort functions. And then what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate which ones of these algorithms are better. And then we're also going to implement them in another video for other purposes. So once again, hopefully you found this video useful. As always, if you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to email me. And thank you for watching.